this session on LGBT inclusion in community life uh, as part of the festival of discovery that we're running. Um, I think it's something that more and more people are thinking about actually is when they are working in their communities when they're living in their communities actually how do they do that inclusively and we wanted to provide a space where people could explore that a little bit learn a little bit and ask some questions so i'm very very pleased that we've been joined by our three exceptional speakers today we are joined by maria Manir from stonewall we are joined by katie john went from the human library and we are joined by chris sims who is joining us with his hat on as a uh, lace market theatre today. So I'm just going to ask our panellists to quickly introduce themselves actually and just tell us a little bit about them before we get into the meat of the discussion. Uh, Maria, can we come to you first please? Hello, sorry about that delay. My name is Maria, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the Associate Director of Community Engagement at Stonewall. So I oversee our trans inclusion work as well as our sport work, our info service, uh, which is our first point of contact for many people across the UK, as well as our UK Black Pride uh, partnership role. Um, outside of Stonewall, I have a background as a consultant, particularly on trans inclusion, uh, specifically to non-binary issues. Uh, I've worked with many organisations such as Times Up UK, Amnesty International, where I'm the trans lead of the Rainbow Network, um, and I've even served as an expert to the United Nations on LGBT uh, plus issues. And I'm really excited to be here today and hopefully share some information as well as an opportunity to welcome you in uh, to our communities as well. So thank you so much Eden Project for having me to take part today. Thank you, Maria. We are incredibly pleased that you can join us. Katie, let's go over to you. Tell us about you. Um, I'm diverse in body and in terms of um, all of the different things um, I am involved in. I'm, I'm a public speaker, educator and activist on gender, sexuality, identity, human rights, mental health, etc., and more. Um, I'm wearing, always wearing multiple hats. I, I would get bored being passionate for only one thing or representing any one organization. So I'm partly here as the Human Library, which is part of an event tomorrow. Um, I'm the UK coordinator for that. Um, I'm also here because I'm also a co-founder of the 50 Shades of Gender podcast on the variety of gender. Um, I run a training organization called Gender Ident Gender on, um, delivering training basically on unconscious bias around gender and sexuality to public sector and more and I'm on the board of my local theatre for diversity as well and um, if that doesn't kind of leave you thinking oh my god can you stop please um, I'll add one more at the end which is I'm the chief diversity officer of an organisation called pickmybrain.world. Thank you Casey and finally Chris tell us about you Chris. Thanks, Sophie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris. Um, I, I work with the University of Nottingham. Um, I'm head of global policy impact there. And um, previously in the previous life, I was also head of education at Stonewall. Um, but I'm here today more in capacity of my non-working life, which mainly focuses around community theatre. Uh, and like Katie, I'm also on the board of directors of my local community theatre, which is the Lace Market Theatre in Nottingham. Um, so uh, really excited to be here today and uh, to be talking alongside such an illustrious panel. I feel very honoured. And thank you for joining us, Chris. We feel very lucky to have you. And I, I am your host. I am Sophie Bridger, the Scotland Country Manager at Eden Project Communities, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, for this role, I worked in the LGBT community for many years, so I'm very, very pleased to be able to mesh these two worlds together and explore this a little bit more. Now, before we kick off, I just wanted to acknowledge that this is actually Trans Awareness Week, and today is actually Trans Day of Remembrance, which forms part of that. So. This is, I think, very timely, um, and I hope that afterwards you'll get, the, normally at this point, I would share a link with you, directing you to some interesting resources on Trans Day of Awareness, but I would like to flag it to you and just say, please do use this as an opportunity to find out more if you don't know more about trans identities and trans lives, and at the end of the session you think you'd like to, this is a really great time to do that. But enough of that, let's kick off the discussion. So first of all, I want to come to you, Maria, for our first question. Because I think this is is very much within your remit, obviously, as as head of community, sorry, associate director of community engagement. Now, um, congratulations. Um, why do you think people who are interested in communities and getting involved in their community should be interested in LGBT inclusion at all? What's the connection for you? 
I think that's a great question and it's definitely something I obviously have to ask myself in my role on a day-to-day basis but I think when we think about communities and we think about doing work in our communities one of the central tenets of that is being able to be open and welcoming of everyone um, and that should include all LGBT plus people. Sometimes it can feel challenging, um, especially if you're not aware uh, of LGBT plus people within your communities, but I can assure you they are definitely there. So the reason why it's important to be interested in what it looks like to create an inclusive environment is because if we start from the mode of operation that people will come to our events, people will want to be part of our communities, that's when we actually are able to open the doors to those people who are interested, who maybe previously didn't feel able able to attend your local event or be part of your organizing group and it's not just that LGBT plus people bring something to your local community in that every single person will bring something to your local community but it's also the fact that if you are seeking to be inclusive of people of color or people of faith or older people or disabled people you can't do that without being lgbt plus inclusive because lgbt people exist across all kinds of spectrums of identities across society and i think one of the things that may sometimes feel challenging about LGBT plus inclusion is feeling worried about, oh, what if I don't have enough knowledge? What if I don't know how to do this thing? But actually, there's a wealth of resources. But furthermore, if you create a almost democratic style of kind of community inclusion at, at its heart, you're al- allowing other people to come and tell you what their needs are as well. And surely the whole point of being part of a community is that everyone has the opportunity to express themselves equally um you know in parity with others everyone has the chance to really get stuck in and be a a key part of what makes that community great so don't be too afraid if you're you think about lgbt plus inclusion and you think oh my gosh i don't know how to achieve that um it is much easier than it sounds. And I hope that throughout this uh, talk today, we'll be able to give you some really great uh, practical tips on how to make that happen. But I, I, I do think that it's, it's really important to remember that LGBT plus people have varied interests as well. There's no reason why an LGBT plus person won't be interested in gardening or won't be interested in uh, putting on some local theater. There's so many different aspects of um, kind of community life that unfortunately LGBT plus people don't always feel able to access because of stigma or because of stereotypes but being able to open the doors metaphorically or physically when lockdown ends um, is just one of the first steps you can take to making sure that your community is LGBT plus inclusive. That is such a a wonderful summary and such a wonderful starting point so thank you. Uh, I think it's it's so important that I think one of the points you raised there was, you know, LGBT people fundamentally are just like anybody else in their community with, you know, diverse interests and histories and different parts of their life that intersect. And they're not just an LGBT person, but for lots of people, that is an important part of their identity. And I think being able to, you know, address that and being able to make sure that all LGBT people are included and welcome is is incredibly important. Um, And you also touched on something there, which I wanted to ask you more about, which is that lots of people don't actually, lots of LGBT people don't get involved in their communities necessarily. I was going to ask you what, again, having said what I've just said, that actually LGBT communities are very diverse and people are different, but do you think that LGBT people broadly have a positive experience in their communities? What's your view on that? So it really does vary, and we have to think about kind of broader communities as well within LGBT plus communities. So, for example, you know, more than a third of trans people um, have experienced discrimination uh, from within, you know, their community. And say, for example, one in five LGBT people of non-Christian faith have also experienced discrimination from within their community. And it's not necessarily just because of their LGBT identity, sometimes it's also because of their faith identity or because of their age or other things. Um, And it's also worth noting that this research I'm talking about comes from our LGBT in Britain series, the Home and Communities Report, uh, which also showed that even for LGBT plus people of colour, nearly half, just over half of them face discrimination from within 
LGBT plus communities. And I think what this actually shows is that when we think about communities, we have to really interrogate what, what do we mean by that? A community should feel like a safe space. It should feel like a, a place where you're able to bring the parts of your identity that you want to bring with you to that space. It should be a place where you feel able to take part, not just because of who you are, but because of your interests and what you're able to bring. So I think some of the challenges that LGBT people face um, kind of in engaging with communities isn't so much that they don't want to, it's that sometimes they try and they face an obstacle. Um, and, and sometimes that can even start at home, right? So for example, for um, gay and lesbian people, um, you know, they are twice as more likely to be out to all their friends and three times more likely to be out to their family compared to bi people. So even when we think about LGBT plus identities, we have to start breaking it down and thinking about what are the different diverse and varied needs of kind of each of LGBT plus kind of communities. Um, and I think when we start to think about that, we can really take the approach of a kind of people centered approach where we think, OK, um, what is it about my event right now that I can change or kind of adapt a little bit so that when LGBT uh, people see it advertised, they know, yes, that is a space where I can go and a space where I'll be able to be myself um, and not have to worry about who I am and how that might come across. So I think that's one of the kind of preliminary barriers that um, people face. But I do think there is a lot of opportunity because as we know, <laughs> even the people on this call are, are really interested and rooted in our local communities. And it's so important that we uh, allow people the space to kind of talk about the pain and the, the discomfort sometimes that it comes with trying to navigate your local community, but also the joy that it can bring. Because for myself, um, being part of my local um, faith community brings me so much joy. And sure, there, there will always be people wherever I go who maybe don't see eye to eye with me on everything. But knowing that I have the support and solidarity of people is enough to make me want to turn up. And then I think, OK, whatever happens, I know I've got people alongside me who can help me navigate anything that comes my way. But fingers crossed, it won't be as bad as it always sounds. <laughs> That's, again, such a, such a wonderful illustration and insight. Thank you. I think. I'm, so something you said there really reminded me of an exchange I had when I was working um, in LGBT inclusion work myself, um, which was, I think, someone who was getting frustrated, they were like, why do I have to make all this, you know, why do I have to put myself out there and actively say that I'm being inclusive? Isn't it enough? Can't people just accept me and kind of come in and, you know, why have people decided that I will not be, you know, inclusive to them or accepting of them? And it was what you said there, actually, which is people are shaped by their experiences. And actually, if you've had negative experiences in your workplace or in your community or um, in any other part of your life, you carry that with you, don't you? And it changes the way that you interact with other people and the expectations that you have. Um, Katie and Chris, I'd love to come to you and talk to you a little bit about actually what's your life like in your community? Do you feel included by your community? Do you feel accepted? And, um, and what does that look like for you? Katie, can we come to you first and then let's go to Chris? Yeah, no, I, and I'd love to um, chip in directly on what um, both you and Mar Mario have just said, actually, because, yeah, we can be shaped by our negative experiences. So, for example, I was asked to leave my faith community because I was trans um, about 12 years ago. And, um, and I was a former theologian and missionary. <laughs> in that in that self same community so even however high up you rise you can still be kicked out if you're the wrong kind of person so to speak um and and i remember being asked by a, a church once um what should we want to be more trans we want to be more lgbt inclusive and things and, you know um we've written a statement you know um and they were already one of the it was an anglican church that and very often you see on the billboard outside at most churches everyone welcome and then there's like the hidden small print of your experience is no not you um or be yourself not like that um and 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 that's when actions speak louder much louder than words and if you're going to put the words up there you've got to back them up and you know and mean it um and all that should be necessary is everyone welcome not having to list everyone oh we are inclusive of lgbt and the rest of the alphabet soup but you should just be able to say everyone means everyone 
um, and, and and as Maria said, be be person centred. Um, and and I think we, I mean, I, I think I'm lucky. I live in Norwich, and I would you know um, put Norwich up there with the likes of kind of I don't know Brighton, Manchester, Cambridge, and Bristol, and probably many other places that people are now going to feel offended. I haven't included their city there, but what I would call quite kind of green, liberal, lefty, LGBT inclusive, arty cities where with strong communities and, and a lot of it is about numbers you know if you live somewhere rural and you literally are the only gay in the village so to speak and, and I know people who aren't out in their village but are out when they come down to the city at the weekend you know and, and numbers make a difference and um, one of the biggest reasons to include LGBT people is because we do make up you know six to ten percent of the population um, and, and if you're running a youth event that number could double or triple you know obviously it's kind of age shift age shifted these days so it, 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 we're going to be there anyway and as as Mari said if you have a, if you have a faith event if you have a if you have some other event you're going to have lgbt people there anyway it's just that they may not feel comfortable or safe to be out because they haven't seen an overt demonstration of everyone welcome and that's to say a demonstration not a description of being welcome um and i think sometimes people therefore do form um, LGBT versions of the rest of communities, structures, clubs, societies, theatres, etc. If they don't find a welcome in the broader version of it, they'll make their own um, smaller version of it. Um, I mean, my city actually has a you know an LGBT table tennis club. Um, why the the person you're playing table tennis with has to have the same sexuality or at least be part of that exact same community with you, it, it shouldn't be even be an issue. But because when you get involved in sports, there is an increased amount of bullying sometimes um, and you don't feel as comfortable to be yourself. Very often we do seek out places where we know that at least everyone should have our back and welcome us. Um, and then sadly, very occasionally, we also then get because LGBT people are humans as well. So we can still um, not be nice to people within our own communities as well. We're not kind of we're, we're no better than everyone else. It's just that we do feel safer around people like us to some extent. But it, it helps both communities and us for us to mix more and create some more cohesive society. And, and when we do that, we discover how much more in common we have, whether it's the faith aspect, whether it's a food aspect, whether it's a sport aspect, a music aspect or whatever. So um, I think the responsibility falls on both communities to include us and, and us as LGBT people to take risks when, when we feel able to do so. You know, it, and if that means going along with a friend so you've got at least one ally with you, then that makes a difference too. That's a, a really lovely summary of a point I wanted to, to touch on. So thank you, Katie. And I think also you've just kind of touched on something there, which again is uh, the, something I hope we'll come to at the end, which are the small practical things that people can do. Um, Chris, let, let's go to you, because I know you're, as you said, you're very involved in community theatre. Um, what is it like being involved for you in, in your community? I mean, for me, I think I should start off by saying that I feel like I come from a position of privilege. Um, I um, a white middle class gay man um, and certainly in community theatre I feel like that's a group that by and large um, it's generalisation but by and large the UK community theatre is fairly comfortable with um, so my experience um, with that particular part of the community has been very positive um, and I know for a fact that that would not be necessarily the same um, if I uh, had a different skin colour or if I was trans, for instance, I think those are quite different things. So I think, you know, there's a need to recognise that um, not all people within, within the LGBT community are the same, as uh, Maria pointed out right at the start, but also that not all community groups are the same. Um, I think my experience, had I gone to join a football team, might be quite different, uh, for instance. Um, so I think there's a need to think specifically about what community group we're talking about um, and, and to be quite nuanced. But within that, I think there's definitely things that one can do um, that apply across the board. So I think there was, um, I think, I think Katie mentioned having something that makes quite clear your commitment to inclusivity um, and, and really making that quite prominent. I think, you know, if, if there is a community group website or if there is, uh, you know, if you have a, a physical message board or something along those lines, just putting that front and centre and making making clear that that's, that's our values makes a big difference. I think then for me, it's about the actual visibility and following through. I think one of the things that really encouraged me to get involved in my local theatre was that I could see 
that they'd previously staged plays, for instance, that touched on LGBT themes. Um, immediately, I thought, okay, this this is somewhere that's 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 open to these kinds of issues, and um, um, and that encouraged me to take the first step. And it's not that I think you need to be constantly harping on about every aspect of diversity, but finding those opportunities just to send out those messages. So, you know, is it Black History Month? Could we do something to mark Black History Month? And is there somewhere that we could then um, put, put that to then um, make it sure it's a, a lasting thing that people will know about us if they come and check us out? Um, you know, and, and similarly with all aspects of diversity, there are, there are these opportunities now to just make those gestures and, and, make, and, and, and follow through with a commitment to diversity in what you then do. The other aspect that I think is important with all this is how you then respond to conflict within within the community and and um, you know if somebody doesn't live up to the behaviours that you want embodied and how that's responded to that can be really hard um, but I think it's something that people do need to look at quite seriously and say how do we show that we mean this um, you know if somebody does behave in a way that doesn't meet those standards do we respond or do we I hope it will go away and the people who are coming and who may be worried about whether they're going to be included they notice things like that and they will notice and so it's just really important that that's something that people are prepared for and ready for i think one of the things that's coming across really clearly um, from all three of you is that um, it really is about what you do um, it's about how you demonstrate inclusion not just say it and i think that's that's something that happens every day isn't it you know it's so there are opportunities where you can go, this is an opportunity for us to do something and actually show that we're being particularly inclusive, but also those opportunities can come up every day. It's about, um, you know, how we interact with other people, how we respond when perhaps someone isn't as inclusive or as understanding as we would like. It's about how we ask about family and friends. Um, those kind of opportunities come up every day. Um, I, we got a question in advance, actually, which I think can comes in quite nicely here, which was about, um, I think we are very familiar in the LGBT community with um, assumptions being made and having to correct people about the assumptions um, that have been made about us, for example. Um, and I just wondered if any of you had any, basically anything that you wanted to add on on that, because I know it's quite a, a quite a common one. We assume things about people's gender we assume things about what their family looks like who they're married to if they are married if they have children um, and that can be quite a a common thing I think in the way that we interact with people I mean my first thing on that is that I mean I I, I like to give people who who do make an assumption at least the benefit of, of the doubt that their intention was good even if the action comes across as not so good in that sense so it, it's not a bit like a, a three strikes and out policy at the very least I will give people at least two chances to um, to learn get it right and, and improve in that sense um, so it's, for me it's about not making people wrong so that when a, when a community is trying to include me I, I try to read the fact that they're trying more than the fact that they got it right, if that makes sense. Um, and that means um, me as, as an LGBT person, you know, being patient, um, being willing to correct gently um, so that they don't get discouraged and think, oh God, that was so much, that was so hard work trying to include LGBT people. And we got slapped the first time we put up something because we said LGBT and we forgot the plus or we didn't include that group or whatever. And because being LGBT in our own, um, activism ideology and inclusiveness is a continually evolving thing anyway some people just don't stay up to date with our latest language so you can't make people trying to include us wrong for you know even just being six months out of date with where we're at so I think it, it, it does mean being uh, gentle in our um, education and affirmation of their attempt to include us. Chris? Yeah, absolutely agree with all of that. And I think the other thing I'd point out is that we are ourselves a very diverse community and we don't always understand each other perfectly and we make our own mistakes. So it's just acknowledging that we're all navigating this same space of trying to understand and appreciate others' perspectives. Um, and the, the more you can approach that with love, the less chance there is of um, somebody backing off completely and worrying, you know, being being more frightened of saying the wrong thing and therefore not saying anything at all, which I think is the, the worst thing that can happen. 
Um, so I just think yeah, always approaching it with, with love and with positive intent is so important for everybody. Mara? Yeah, I think to add to that, I think there's a little bit in there about kind of each person's individual boundaries and kind of the consent needed, I think, to broach certain topics. So sometimes I think all, all it takes is if you have a question, just ask someone if if they're okay with you asking them that question because then at least you give them the opportunity to say no because there may be some things where for some people they are more open about you know um, their family life or maybe what it's like at work but for other people they may not want to talk about that in fact they may be coming to your local community event because they want to kind of get away from whatever is happening in their life so I think it's about giving people the option um, and that in itself actually can sometimes make people feel more able to actually answer your questions because then they're thinking, wow, this person's actually thinking about what it's like to be asked these kinds of questions all the time. So, for example, for me, when people want to ask me questions about being non-binary, I really have to think, OK, is this question coming because they couldn't be bothered to Google it? Or is this question coming because they have a, a question that they they want to ask me because I'm someone of lived experience and that's something you can't always get off Google? And what I appreciate most is when people actually ask me, hey, um, am I okay to ask you this question? If not, uh, I can try and find out the answer myself, but I just thought I'd might that you might want to discuss it with me. And then I really appreciate that because those are the people that I feel able to then spend more time and energy on. Um, and, and as both kind of Katie and Chris have said, there's so much diversity within LGBT plus communities that say, for example, my experience as a kind of non-binary person of color, um, who's also a Muslim, who's also many other things, um, you know, not everyone will know about my experiences because frankly, I don't get a lot of airtime <laughs> um, for issues or kind of things that directly relate to my identity. I'm often left out or forgotten. So when someone wants to talk to me about it, sometimes I feel able to do that. But then other times someone might approach me and be like, oh, so have you been disowned? What was it like being disowned? And I'm like, excuse me, that's a huge assumption to make, not just because you're being kind of transphobic, but you're also being racist and also Islamophobic to assume those things. And I think sometimes that doesn't mean that someone's going to point at you and be like, you're a X, Y, Z ist. No, I think it's about taking a bit of personal responsibility as well and thinking, right, why am I asking this question? Who am I asking it to? Why do I need to know the answer? Is this person the right person to ask? Have I asked them if they actually want to answer? And it's just about mutual respect, because if anyone kind of came off the street and just randomly asked you like, oh what was it like having children or like what was it like you know when you had to care for someone that you know it, it's a personal question right and lgbt plus identities they are as personal as any other part of us and it's at the end of the day it's about creating that mutual respectful space where people feel able to to be themselves and to do that sometimes you just have to to ask and i think that's the best way to make sure that you get what you need, but also that the person that you're talking to gets to leave feeling like they've had a conversation, not not an interrogation. I love that, a conversation, not an interrogation. There are so many things in there for me that I, I could unpack. I think for me, it's often about, it's about context, isn't it? So I might have conversations with people I've known for years where we talk about, you know, the real depth of their experience and, you know, what, the terrible things that people have said to them and the wonderful things that have gone on in their life because they're LGBT. But maybe if I've just met that person for the first time, that's not a good time or place for that conversation. You know, you, you know, those things are, are personal to someone's life and you want to actually, you know, ask them, like you say, you know, you want to let that person know that you're asking because you care about them rather than just because you're curious. I think one of the other things that uh, Maria actually mentioned to me in a, in a previous conversation, which I think was very well put, is that actually there are lots of people in the LGBT community who are really, really happy to speak about their experiences and will put themselves out there as educators and as advocates. And it's definitely worth trying to find those people in your life, in your community and online rather than necessarily latching on to the nearest LGBT person and expecting them to fulfill that role because of all the things that we've just said. Now, I'm aware that the time is ticking on. Actually, there are a couple of things that I wanted to, to ask you all before we go on to questions. Um, I know that my colleagues um, on, are on the call to support. So if you do have any questions, um, remember that you can just uh, pop your hand up uh, using the participant function. And I, Mo, I'm gonna ask you to help me field those questions when we come to that part. 
So I just wanted to finish off by, we talked a lot about actually what are the things that really help you feel included in a space. So Chris, for example, you talked about the fact that your theatre group had actually been involved in, um, you know, LGBT related productions before, which sent a kind of good sign to you that that was what that was about. Um, you know, that that group was an inclusive space. Um, I'd really love to hear from each of you. What are things you think that people can do in a space that would just make you feel more accepted? What makes you step into a space and go, I'm going to be okay here? Should we go to Casey first and then maybe to Mario? Um, well, it goes back to some of my, my first statements, really. It's the saying, everybody welcome. Um, the next thing I want to do is see proof of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, 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 and that is, I mean, if you're talking about, say, going into a community space that includes a venue, and I'm sure Chris can pipe up on this as well, but if you've got a venue, that means making sure that your staff are inclusive. Um, it's, it's all very well saying that the, the you know, the, the chair of the board is, or the, 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 the president of this or that, or the person who runs the theatre is X, Y, Z, but it's got to be everybody in the entire organisation, especially down to the person who opens the door to you the person who serves you a drink at the venue and if you're getting in outside staff to 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 run stuff at a venue as well so i'm you know you're going to get your first impressions counts i guess is what i'm saying so the first the first point of contact with the public has also got to be an inclusive person visible signage that um everything from you know a, a rainbow flag a trans flag the newer more inclusive um, extra striped rainbow flag um having gender neutral toilets i mean you can even the very nature of someone just having either one extra or relabeling of to include gender neutral toilets makes you think oh my god they thought about this and if they thought about it even if they're not 100 percent of the way there yet you go okay they're thinking about it they're trying and again vi visible demonstrations of things like that and signage and there's so many ways to do inclusion and sometimes that you know that that trying to signpost the fact that you're trying to be inclusive may come off wrong but if i can read the intent in it um i will feel that much better and i've seen and there's no one way always to do it either um i i've seen some organizations you know specifically stating things like this event is open to women and non-binary people men and non-binary people and including that way or others saying this is a women's plus event adding the plus sign to the end of it. There's no need to kind of remove to necessarily include, if that's what I'm saying, including LGBT people should not actually involve um, the people who are outside that spectrum in their community feeling like they're getting less or, or, or you know, or they're being invaded or anything else like that. It's just adding and signposting additional inclusivity and, and as I say, meaning it at the point of first contact. Thank you. Maria? Yeah, I think um, that intention and that effort really shines and it really does go the extra mile. So I remember getting off a coach um, for my first day at campaign boot camp, which is a kind of campaigns training. And I got off the coach and I, I just saw two people in campaign boot camp t-shirts with their pronouns on their lanyard. And there had not been any kind of communication, like a big hoo-ha, like, oh, we will have pronouns on our lanyard. But I stepped off and I saw that. And immediately I was like, you know what? These people, they, they're not just thinking about me, but they're thinking about themselves and each other as well. They're thinking about how allyship doesn't just benefit the community whom you're aiming for, but it actually benefits everyone because it creates a more caring community, a, a community that can stand in solidarity with, with one another. And I think as well, um, when it comes to specifically LGBT plus inclusion, I think it's actually kind of making space for kind of lesbian, gay, bi, trans and other people within your community. So a lot of the time um, kind of efforts can focus on um, lesbian and gay people, um, but sometimes that there, there will be some bi exclusion going on there or, or trans exclusion. And I think when I say exclusion, I don't just mean kind of, oh, the doors are shut, you can't come in. That's that's not what I mean. I mean, when you think about the kind of stories that you want people to 
to feel and connect with when it comes to your community uh, what are you putting on your kind of social media pages what are you putting in those little groups that you have for people to talk to one another when it comes to lgbt history month or kind of other parts of the year that uh, occur what are you doing to make sure that everyone knows that you're here that you're listening that you're holding space for one another um or when kind of you think about uh not just events but the kind of safe space that you create do lgbt plus people feel able to talk about themselves and their families kind of we already talked a little bit about boundaries and consent but for people to be able to open up and be able to come along as their full self um maybe it goes a little bit of the way to thinking about the type of language you use so for example uh when it comes to uh people and having different families so uh rather than kind of being like oh you know um talking in a very stereotypical kind of a man and a woman that's it plus children type way being able to talk more with kind of more neutral language like partners or just listening actually listening to the language people use about themselves and then replicating that because sometimes what people are doing is giving you verbal cues um so for example when i talk about uh my uh friends i i or my family i'll, I'll use sibling instead of sister or brother or something else and that's just me trying to give the person who's listening a cue to say that's the language i would like you to to use with me um so that what i'm trying to say is that sometimes it can feel like there's like a huge checklist that you need to do to to make people feel included um in in these spaces but actually lgbt plus people want to be hands-on fully involved in um, their local communities just like anybody else so being able to allow space for people to bring ideas to bring their knowledge to bring tips and to really make it kind of bespoke to your local area because communities can vary so massively and say if you're for example um a community for people of faith then lgbt plus people within it who, who practice uh, faith in the same way as you may have a very different experience to say lgbt plus people from another faith so allowing those people to come and actually just share their expertise um in, in the in the same way that you would expect every single member of your local community to feel able to share expertise and shape your local community to be the best that it can be not in a way where you kind of elect a uh, an lgbt plus person necessarily and say now it's your job to make us inclusive but just giving everyone ownership but at the end of the day if you have committees there's no reason why you can't also have an lgbt plus officer um, who can help keep you on track to make sure that everyone feels safe welcome and included thank you maria and uh, finally chris and then we'll go to questions uh, yeah i just just say very quickly that i just think remember that that your face-to-face -face contact with people isn't your only front door you know especially these days um think about the other ways in which people experience you for the first time i'm thinking particularly the website obviously but also simple things like the bureaucracy you use if you have a form that that um, people fill in to to join you or to find out more about more information about you for instance you know can you look at that and think is there something here that we can improve um are we asking people to say mr or miss for instance uh, and we're not giving them another option something that simple can often go a massive long way i think just just it can be something quite small that just sends out a signal that makes somebody realize ah someone's thought about this um you know if you have um community photos for instance um you know and you've got lots of married couples or couples people are obviously couples on those photos do you have any same-sex couples up there it doesn't have to be a big thing you don't have to make a big thing of it but the smallest signal can make a big difference for someone feeling there's been a bit of thought for this and i feel able to take that step so just think about those other front doors as well brilliant thank you all for for sharing that insight and i think there's so many tips in there uh so many things that people can do and i think what you've all demonstrated is that LGBT inclusion is about trying to connect with someone to value them as a person and it's about the intent that goes into it as much as what you do itself um, and I'm really grateful to you all for, for sharing your insight. Now we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, Mo, do we have any questions to take? Does anyone pop their hand up? Because if not, I've got other questions and frankly, I can still talk all day. 
I'm just going to echo what Chris said um, in terms of website forms and, and entry points and showing diversity on them. I mean, it just makes my heart bounce every time I see someone who's made the effort just to add MX into the uh, the titles box and to add an other box to anything else that's overtly binary. And, and that means, again, I immediately know that someone started to make an effort and it's an, it's an incredible I I inclusive first step. Um, so it's, it's you know, just make small things like that and you start to feel like they're on the right track. One of the questions that I really wanted to ask the panel, which I hadn't had time to, is we talked a little bit about the fact that actually LGBT communities, basically LGBT communities are like rich and diverse and actually LGBT people often won't spend a lot of time in those communities because it's safe and affirming and we feel comfortable there for really good reasons. Um, and then lockdown kind of changed a lot of that and that's had a big impact it's put all of us in a very fixed geographical space and for a lot of lgbt people i imagine actually that's meant not being able to be physically part of an lgbt community in the same way um do any of you have any any thoughts or any kind of reflections on that is that something that's affected you even though it's, it's Transgender Day of Remembrance today, it's the first time in 10 years I haven't been able to celebrate that face to face. And again, um, my city has had a pride for 11 years and I was on, you know, on the committee of that for its first three years. And it's the first time I haven't been able to celebrate pride face to face. So, yeah, I think it's it's really important for LGBT people to, to gather and to not be able to do that for eight months now um, that I think it is disproportionately affecting us. I know it's disproportionately affecting other groups in society, um, like the elderly, the, the people with um, chronic illnesses, etc., people who are sheltering. But I think it has been particularly hard on LGBT communities. I can build on that if that's OK. So um, from my experiences, uh, lockdown has exacerbated some issues that were kind of already going on for many LGBT plus people. Um, so, for example, you know, just like many other people, um, a, a third of people had their medical appointments cancelled. Um, you know, nearly half of people want need more access to mental health support at this time. And there's so many things about um, kind of being LGBT plus that things like mutual aid and solidarity have often been the currency and kind of the way that LGBT plus people have supported each other when maybe the systems or kind of haven't been there to support them through those things. And obviously through lockdown, um, mutual aid became, you know, you know, something that people were practicing on a much wider scale. Communities were really coming together and kind of joining together in resilience to make sure that nobody was left behind. And I think what's really important is that obviously whilst people, you know, like Katie mentioned, may not be able to travel to other places where they feel more welcome, people are looking for their home, right, where they live as well as where they'd like to be. And that's why I think it's even more vital that given that lockdown may go on for an indefinite period of time, we may be in and out of lockdown repeatedly uh, and facing different levels of restrictions across the country. It's so important that we just are able to open that virtual door to everyone in our community. And if you haven't maybe been able to say kind of strongly so in the past that we are here for all LGBT plus people, now is the time to do it because people are waiting and getting ready to help. Um, I've I've heard a few reports of you know some LGBT plus people who've tried to get involved in local mutual aid groups and you know faced discrimination and it's really disheartened them. But I'm sure that that's not going to be the case everywhere. And even when that does occur, I hope that through kind of talks like this, through finding ways to support one another, we can help reduce instances of that. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that not everyone is living in a safe environment. Um, you know, almost a quarter of young people are at risk of homelessness, um, usually because of familial rejection. Um, and, you know, more than one in 10 LGBT people have faced domestic abuse from a partner. And this rises to nearly 20 percent for trans people. And these are things that, unfortunately, many people, regardless of whether they are LGBT plus or not, are facing at this time. So it's really important that to be able to support LGBT plus people, it's about recognizing that we actually do unfortunately have a lot of things in common that make our lives harder. But for some people, it's being LGBT plus that actually means that 
they don't get the support that they need in the same way as, as someone else might. So I think using this opportunity to really just think, right, what does community look like? What do we want people to feel like? We want people to feel safe, respected and able to participate. Okay, let's extend that olive branch because people are often just waiting to, to feel seen. Um, and now is the best time, I think, to make those whose lives may have been rendered invisible because of this pandemic to know that they have that visibility and that, that they can and will be seen um, no matter where they are. That's brilliant. Thank you both. Um, and I'm afraid that we are going to have to leave it there. Our conversation um, flew past. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for coming today and particularly grateful to our amazing speakers, uh, Maria Minir, Katie John Wendt and Chris Sims. Thank you so much for, for giving up your time to, to share your experiences and your insight with us. Um, we feel very lucky to have you. Um, the only other thing I would like to add is uh, just to remind you that the Festival of Discovery is uh, carrying on for the rest of the day and tomorrow as well. Um, Katie John Wendt has already mentioned that they are facilitating a human library event tomorrow, which is another great opportunity actually to find out more about um, different walks of life, different experiences, if that is something you are interested in. Thank you, Katie. And uh, we would very much encourage you to explore that and all the other amazing events that we have on. We're also uh, being joined by Eddie Izzard this evening. So we're very much looking forward to welcoming Ben as well. Um, and I think all that remains for me to say is just thank you all again for giving up your time to join us. We have loved having you here and loved seeing you. And we hope to see you at another event very soon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for hosting. Cheers. Bye, guys. Thank you.